So the aims of today's talk, specifically with the intention of sharing experiences from London and Scene, which is a community-led approach to history telling. We're going to be talking about the ups and downs of sharing multiple community histories that are bound up in London's architecture and landscape, and also consider some of the challenges, hopes, plans for the future of this work, and I think raise questions as well. So we welcome you know, any questions that come from people as well or any comments that people have. Um, so firstly, just to introduce ourselves, uh, I, previously to this, I worked as a, a teacher for many years, after which I moved into the arts and <clears throat> had, been, had been working with an organisation that focused on women in photography and kind of shining a light on, again, quite invisibilised work by women. And I've been working on this project with Damali, uh yeah me <laughs> yeah you <laughs> yeah um so yeah i'm damily um i've worked as an arts well as a curator and a producer and researcher of arts education projects uh for a long time now um and much of that's working with you know it's community driven um working a lot with schools and uh community groups um uh yeah so in terms of how we got involved, we essentially, we responded to, uh, we put a bid in uh, for this project when we saw it, we thought we, we saw quite a few interesting um, sort of parallels with the work and our own interests to get involved in it. So that's how we got involved. So what is London Unseen, you may ask? So London Unseen is a her uh, season of heritage walks, tours, um, trails, hence the trails and tribulations, uh, talks and events that have been taking place since July. The season will end um, in November, so we've only got a few weeks left. Um, it emerged from a series of roundtable discussions between the Mayor of London's Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm and groups of community heritage practitioners. Um, so far we've engaged uh, over 900 people in more than 36 events and we've worked with uh, 39, around 39 and a little bit more practitioners. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, you can see here listed all the different sort of histories that we've kind of specifically looked at um, and explored. Um, mm. It's worth it's well worth <laughs> you looking up um, the Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm to sort of get a bit more of a background on on their work as a whole. Mm. Um, it's a yeah Sadiq Khan initiative, and I think it was set up what, a year two years ago. Yeah, and I think it's been too. Doing a yeah. Lot, yeah, it's been doing a lot of uh, work on how we can make the public realm more um, equitable, uh, particularly, yeah. you know, after those you know questions around um, statues and uh, memorials mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. Um, so we've also included in the season public workshops, which were specifically aimed at young people to enable them to learn things about history in London's public spaces and then respond to them creatively according to their own you know their own backgrounds what speaks to them and other workshops we've also kind of threaded into the the season have been focused or aimed at people who are actually interested in working on community storytelling or some kind of community work and they've been aimed at using exemplars to give guidance advice um yeah and actually the range of people coming to the coming to those workshops was really really good to see all the different ideas and projects that they can feed into based on what came out of the workshops and apart from the sort of public the things that we've been aiming putting together for the public um we've also organized some events which are curated specifically for the practitioners themselves so kind of to foster stronger networks to offer them training um support collaboration offer funding or talk about funding opportunities so quite a range of things London Unseen is and it's probably a bit more than this to be honest <laughs> but yeah um and here's just a few images from from parts of the walks of the season and um wait, wait, yeah. just to quickly say I think um sure you know we've worked with sort of these 39 practitioners and each one of those practitioners has 
an incredible sort of story to tell uh, themselves about how yeah. they got into the practice, how they got into their um, work and why they took it on and the amount that they do for, you know, a lot of the time for nothing for a, for a good period of time until yeah. they're sort of more established. So I think each, you know, and we're working really individually as well. We're trying to really connect with people and develop those relationships. And yeah, these are yeah. some just a, just some of the amazing uh, events and walks and stuff that we've been on. V, do you want to yeah. take a couple? Of yeah, I mean, just even thinking about what you've said, the 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 two pictures on the top, on the far ends uh, with the plaques, they've been they were they were the work of somebody called Jeff Simmons who focuses his work on the history of the community in Wandsworth. And I'm just always blown away at the kind of work he does because it, it looks and it is a really, a really fantastic example of community led, community supported work. Um, and he looks at all the different types of communities, community histories within Wandsworth. And that, that pla the, the picture of the plaques at the top is tooting migrants. And the other ones are about gypsy Romani travellers in a particular street in Wandsworth. And it's really about recognising what's the people that have been in London and the people that have contributed to what makes London what it is, but what isn't always celebrated in other places. Um, and then, you know, this, this organisation, uh, Unseen Tours, I don't know if you can see my mouse. <laughs> can you see my mouse? It's like circling, <laughs> yeah. That's an organization called Unseen Tours that are doing amazing work as well. They actually work with people who have experienced homelessness and they train them to do the research and run history tours themselves. And they really are able to give a much more nuanced view of public spaces and living in public spaces in London. Um, Especially around... Um ownership of those spaces as well isn't it? you know because obviously they've come from this background or, uh, for example the one walk that I went on you know very aware of where areas are supposed to be public yeah. but are quite clearly controlled and uh watched and you know are just not public at all so mm. that's a yeah, really interesting sort of addition yeah and then there's two quite different projects but that both kind of use uh AR to show histories, explore histories, talk about histories. Um, one of them is, is made by Chinese Arts Now. They've got this app that you use, it's like a self-guided tour around Chinatown and you, you hear, um, they do scripts, dramas, plays, uh, music, and they're talking about the history through art, uh, as well as you know other forms of storytelling. So that's really incredible. And then this other one in the middle, Aswam is, an AR statue of a woman called Marcia Rigg, whose brother died in police custody in Brixton Police Station. And they've put this statue of her, which is an AR statue right outside Brixton Police Station, where she goes every year to lay flowers for her brother and is still campaigning uh, for these things to be dealt with in, in, in the right way. Um, so, and then you've got legends like Tony Warner from Black History Walks. Uh, there's just such a range of things happening out there that we could literally talk for hours on, just on this. But I don't know, Damley, you want to say anything else about this slide before I move on? Um, no, I think just to yeah. say that, um, you know, we try to bring in different ways of uh, engaging with the walks as well. So the bottom left on the screen is, is a talk that's led by... Uh, DJ Ritu and that's actually in collaboration with um, South Asian Visual Arts Network and uh, because it originated from um, the painting course at Camberwell Art College they started doing these walks um, and we sort of uh, collaborated with them and that's a, a, that sort of led to this idea of people creating artwork in response to the walk and then hopefully we're going to have some of those those pieces to to show at our final sort of event celebration in December. Um, mm. But I think also just, just to say about the, the range of um, practitioners in terms of like their experience. So uh, kind of middle right, <laughs> it's Asif Shakur who is, you know, he's a completely independent scholar, self-taught researcher. Um, so we have people who are really just 
coming into this field, but also those who had been um, in it for a very long time. Um, you know, and, and each each practitioner needs different support and different kind of, uh, yeah, what, you know, what they're looking for, you know, what they're looking to get out of it. Um, but I think we're able to support each one by communicating yeah. with them, do you know what I mean? By really listening to what people needed and wanted. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so having heard all that, and after the roundtable discussions, the CDBR recognised the quality and range of this grassroots work taking place across London. So they wanted to formulate a season which would kind of gather and amplify these hidden community histories and highlight the value of community-led history, heritage and practice and the resources that exist across London. As you can see, we've just touched on a few and you know, there's a lot more actually. Um, and also to enable more Londoners to, to actively explore these diversity histories and see, you know, proper representation of London's rich public realm. Um, so we, we, are, we actually were able to offer these walks for free. Yeah. So in that way, lots more people, anybody could come as long as they're free. Um, and also to enable connections and relationships between the actual pr practitioners and institutions that are working with this, these types of community histories. Just to say as well, yeah, so um, actually, oh, no, it's cool, we've just gone. Yeah, there. okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, go on. Yeah, just this, this slide is just about the actual um, management and approach, I think, from our perspective. Um, and there's, there was, you know, our understanding of the project and the needs of the project really changed as we went along. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things to, to just let you know is, is that we were given a pot of money um, to distribute amongst uh, practitioners, uh, which was great. And it wasn't a lot of money, but it meant that we could offer something um, up, uh, you know, which was just so welcomed. And uh, even though I've been on the other end, you know, as a as someone, as a creative practitioner, as a producer that's been searching for funding, you kind of forget how um, even a small pot, even a thousand pounds can make such a massive difference, especially mm. when it's given in a way that just suits you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, we, you know, we were very much able to say, okay, what can, how can we help you? How can we use this money to help you? And mm. think through that, that kind of process with them. Mm, exactly. And it did mean that, it, you know, and, and as you said earlier, different practitioners require different have different needs so it just meant that you know there was there was a lot of these conversations connections building relationships and really kind of exploring what would be the best way for this money to be spent for each individual person that we worked with you know it wasn't just a standard approach um yeah, but these are some of the things that we were sort of thinking through when we when we took it on, like the, you know, getting to grips with the scope of the project, you know, it seemed pretty overwhelming at first, how to, mm. how to work with all these different histories. Um, yeah. When, and even to find them as well, right? Mm, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. And which is really, something that's really nice is that people, you know, the more that London Unseen is being, um, heard of, heard about the more people we're, you know, the more interest we're getting from different practitioners that aren't easily accessible or aren't easily findable on online or um, mm. through social media. Um, yeah. yeah. And then we were lucky to have Layers of London actually as a partner mm. Um, mm. right from the start, which was really, really brilliant because I think that a lot of the practitioners could see the benefit of you know trying to map or trying to record their walks and um, their histories on two layers of London so hopefully that will lead to more partnerships there I know mm. that uh, yeah um, one of our partners I mean one of the our colleagues actually we're also really lucky to and I know she's on here as well somewhere in the audience but we're working mm. with Sadia Ahmed who, from Everyday Muslim um, who's also worked independently with Layers of London and I think that that's been a really important partnership for us mm. as well yeah, exactly. um, for a number of different yeah. reasons and I'm sure we'll touch them touch on them in a, in a bit but we also work with L London Festival of Architecture but unfortunately we came to them a little bit after their core festival so that's a partnership that we can build on hopefully for the future 
um, mm. and also Open City as well. Um, yeah. But you do yeah. Want to carry on with the yeah, I mean, one thing I just wanted to add to in terms of the scope of the project and even trying to find and connect to practitioners, apart from the people that we knew, it was really useful to have to have the GLA behind us because through sort of their networks as well, we were able to to draw on the networks that they already had, you know, develop those and then bring in new practitioners as well. So that was a really useful thing to have to enable sort of the size and the scope and the amount and the, and the sort of the types of connections that we could make. Um, so of course, one of, the, one of the key considerations was this idea of inclusivity, um, you know, whose histories, you know, do we want to, you know, do, do, we, do we want to try not to, you know, exclude, you know, how do we get boroughs involved? Um, what sorts of events do we want to organize you know we wanted obviously it's main is predominantly a public festival but we did also want to make these sort of closed focused events which were specifically aimed at bringing together the practitioner so just trying to balance and uh shape all of those things actually it was you know it was quite a big challenge but it, you know things fell into place you know as much because the the practitioners were so were so great to work with actually, you know, all in all, you know, they were so great to work with and so happy to get involved. Um, but of course, also the fact that we were working, you know, for the, uh, we were commissioned by this group that kept comes out of the GLA, we also had to consider and, and you know, combined with the fact that we're talking about histories that for some people are, some people don't, some people want to hush them down, there was a lot of politics that we had to weigh up and think about the sorts of risks that could come up with uh, having this sort of public facing with the with the mayor of London's office behind it. So, you know, those what those were other considerations that we had to to really think about and find the best solutions that we could find to kind of minimize any potential, you know, frictions that could that could come up there. I think, I think um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's always, I mean, that's why the Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm exists, because there is this, mm. these issues between um, politics and people and histories and space and uh, mm. place and ownership. And, and I think that some people, you know, some practitioners who have been going and working for a very long time in the public realm have been uh, let down repeatedly in the past by, you know, lots of different, you know, for lots of different reasons for, you know, and I think it's about, uh, there was a lot to do with building trust for, for in some of those relationships, which, um, you know, is, is hard when you're coming in from a completely different space, but it's, and you, but you absolutely recognize how this has happened and how this has come to be and, and the work mm. needed to be done. And, and, and it just sort of does compound how committed these practitioners are that they just keep going they keep going and you know because the because it's so important the work that they're doing um and it is it's a very interesting i mean for, for us personally i think as well like both of us i hadn't really ever gone on a public walk like a walk like this a guided walk um i kind of felt that that was something you maybe do in i've done it in other countries when i've been visited but i've never done it in in london and I, I think that that's a that's an issue. That's a massive issue mm -hmm. because what I've learned uh, by going on these walks is that you know I've I've definitely felt like if I had seen this stuff when I was younger, um, that would have really helped. And both myself and Vanessa are immigrants to this country. Like you know, and we've all we've struggled with a sense of belonging. But if I'd have known some of these things, mm -hmm. there are immediate connections there, and that's mm -hmm. physical that's physical space we're talking about that you can walk mm. through and that's supportive I think so I think there's mm. something that's um yeah I think that's it's a very powerful thing to go on these walking tours yeah I agree I might be jumping ahead sorry no 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 don't worry jump around um <laughs> delivering so yeah. I mean one thing that really really came up quite immediately what I mean that this work is about quality and the quality of the research that's taking place by these individuals that are passionate about what they're doing and it just as Damily said how they sustain and maintain this work over decades you know obviously some people have been working a lot 
you know, for a lot, a much shorter time, but for some people it's been decades. And it, this work is challenging. And I mean, this is, this is even on this, on this slide, what arises from these histories. It's often traumatic history. It's often history, which is potentially uplifting, but then, you know, potentially really difficult to, to grapple with and to, you know, to, to see all around you, to see in these spaces, definitely some of the walks I went on, I've been on, it, it does make me look at places that I go through every day in a, in a very, very different light. And that sort of real, seeing that sort of history in, in the real world is, is a much more tangible way of uh, learning about history, but also it raises other challenges you know, with what, you know, how, what do you do with that afterwards, with some of these things that arise from some of these histories. But the thing I wanted to say about quality, apart from the work that these practitioners do, is the fact that it's important for them to have small groups that they take around. London is an extremely noisy place. You know, you're, you're trying to move people through the streets, speak to them about things, you know, cars are beeping, et cetera, et cetera. And for them, it's really important to have, you know, about 20, maximum 25 people on a walk. So it really raised sort of questions as well about, you know, when you're evaluating things, you know, the usual, the usual go-to is people want huge numbers. But actually in this situation, it, that's not a sign of a good walk. Well, that wouldn't be a good walk, actually. <laughs> you know, and so it is about the intimate spaces and intimate sharing of histories and even intimate sharing of histories which are traumatic and so which need to be handled in sort of an, in sort of a safe space as well. Um, I think that also it also gives the space because uh, I think on one of the walks you went on, be um, on the Sikh history tour, somebody in the audience, somebody in the in, on the walk. Um, you know recognized a name it was you were looking at a memorial or something was it I think her great grandfather was actually being spoken about on the walk uh, and he was memorialized in one of these uh, uh, yeah, building so these structures that was, yeah yeah, yeah. And so, and, so, yeah. Yeah, sorry, not only that, I mean, even the other one, uh, another one I went on recently, which was the Gypsy uh, Romani Traveller Heritage. Uh, one man who joined that walk, had, he lives in North London now, but his whole family grew up in Wandsworth. And we, again, we passed his great, he saw his great grandfather's grave. And so, you know, we're getting these very, like, again, intimate, real, uh, you know, real histories that people are experiencing and kind of connects yeah. to in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. It sort of really exemplifies that that idea of um, again. Sorry to borrow your uh, your title, which I simply it is. It's the layers of London, like you know, that all of these histories that come out. You know, the memories of being, you know, growing up in that area and what used to be there, and the transition, the ch the changing, you know, of the spaces. Um, yeah, it's it's such a beautiful way to remember. You know, or to to go through remembering what was there before um, mm. as well. I think that was mm -hmm. a really uh, amazing one for me as well. Um, yeah, the image here is um, uh, of um, the first ever partition event held in any city hall, which was curated by Sadia Ahmed, um, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who's our who's our kind of curator, a fellow curator on the program. Um, and that was a brilliant event that we, we were sort of commissioned to do these quite, you know, a few quite big events. Um, and this was one which was just brilliant. And, you know, mm -hmm. we had our colleague who works for the GLA just saying the other day that this is actually after following the event was the first time he had heard his mum and his auntie ever talk about partition. They'd never spoken about it before until they'd, until they'd gone to this event. And, and it was sort of like, you know, enabled them to think about this and, and to, to relive it because obviously mm. the, again it's an incredibly difficult painful um you know uh, process or, or you know memory tr triggering memories and stuff but actually it was really done in such a constructive and uh, brilliant way of discussing what you know what could look what could a partition memorial look like what other things are being done to remember and, and process process mm. what's happened so 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this this idea of conversations is really a key thing as well that keeps happening in on these walks and in these events that happen. It it creates space for these conversations to take place, for people to kind of come together. And some people are connected to these histories directly. Others are interested in the area, for example, or they just want to go on a walk because they like doing these things and learning about things. But I think the conversations that I've heard coming up in so many of these walks and the amount of knowledge that is actually held in the people that are coming on these walks, whether it's from their own family histories or memories, is another um, is another layer to this this type of work, which is very powerful and again intimate and very personal and very human. Um, so yeah. I mean, so other things that came up with delivering it, other sort of, I guess, challenges or things that we had to navigate were how we communicate the season. Obviously, again, us being producers in this sort of liminal space between the practitioners and the GLA who's, uh, and, you know, who's doing the main sort of communicating of the season, that itself had sort of its own, its own things that we had to learn about and kind of learn how to navigate and work with. Um, which, you know, which took a little while, but, you know, th those sorts of things fell into place. But that was interesting. It was interesting to see the dynamics of those those sorts of different spaces that we were working within as well. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in terms of evaluation, again, apart from think apart from these questions about quality and quantity, we really have been thinking a lot about kind of what is useful evaluation in on a project like this, on a project that really is is grappling and tackling with all the things that we've been discussing already today. And I think one of the things that definitely has emerged is this idea of sort of it's it's a it's it's something that enables us to learn about how we're doing this kind of work as well and to learn from the practitioners about their needs and how to be able to respond to those needs in order to you know, um, help their work to expand as much as possible. Um, and it's just that idea, and you know, it's just the idea of how do we, you know, how are we sort of quantifying quality and what does that look like? And these are, I think, interesting questions that have come up from, from this type of work and the spaces that we're working in. I think also a huge layer to do with evaluation, um, which is actually really, it's, and it's really difficult, is, uh, you know, because you can look at social media and you can look at the feedback that our tweets have gotten and stuff, and actually you'll probably find some pretty nasty things that we, you know, that sort of came up in response to the Mayor of London tweeting about this or uh, Mayor of London Culture Team tweeting about this. Which was, uh, which is really horrendous for us, but it also really speaks to how, um, I mean, a, it speaks to you know the fact that we've got there are always trolls, right? But also, be like how important this work is in trying to communicate our sh the shared, you know, our shared her heritage. But you know, mm -hmm. all of us, we're not, we're not, we're not flagging one, you know, history over another. Mm. all of these connections are incredibly important mm. um what's the next slide B? because <laughs> maybe just um yeah i just wondered about when do we speak about the relay because i think that's a good one to at any point yeah, yeah at any point you can talk about it now yeah um so one of the walks actually that um vanessa mainly curated was this relay walk where we had four practitioners um sort of handing the baton on to each other it was uh black history only one of black history walks Abdul Malik Taylor um, from Muslim History Tours, uh, Rav Singh, A Little History of the Sikhs, and Mansi um, Papale from um, History Speak, uh, who does uh, Empire and uh, History of Empire. And there was this sort of, you know, handing on of the baton around Trafalgar Square on this walk, uh, which is the first time any of them have done something like that. And actually, the conversations that were happening between them. Um, you know, just really like highlighting those overlaps and those places mm. where those histories connect and and can, you know, they bounce off each other and they can reflect with each other. 
um, I think it was a, a brilliant, a, such a brilliant, almost like a realization of of layers of London. Do you know what I mean? If you put those, if you put the map in real life, that's what we kind of were able to do there, which I think was, mm. is so, again, really, really powerful um, when thinking about physical space and the, and the, mm. the it. yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing about a walk like that is that, let's just say, I mean, one of the women I spoke to, a black woman who was on the walk, she would normally be interested in going on black history walks and potentially wouldn't be looking at any other sorts of walks. And she said it was so, so interesting to have come on this walk because listening to the other histories that were being shared, she could see that they were shared experiences, you know, and I felt the same thing going on many walks myself, listening to other histories that I don't think have anything to do with me, actually realizing there are, you know, we're all on this island, <laughs> you know, this, you know, the, these things have all come together, you know, on this island. So they're, we're all linked. So these are really, um, yeah, really sort of golden moments to be able to see these things and share these things and learn from these things really. Um, yeah, so just to skip through outcomes because I know we want to leave time for discussion because it'd be yeah. really good for us to hear from you all. But yeah. um, So outcomes, in, again, we, we sort of talked about how we wanted to um, enable training for the practitioners. So we were able to deliver a, a, a workshop around access, which was brilliantly delivered by an organization called Purple Stars. And it immediately like, you know, reset, were, the practitioners were really receptive and took those things on board, which is uh, brilliant, I think. Uh, we're going to be doing a workshop that looks at case studies between universities and um, community heritage practitioners and looking at the funding behind that because I think there's a, there's a real this this junction <laughs> uh, <laughs> to connect um, with you know support some of the policies around that. Um, as you said, we're going to be doing an exhibition uh, around this sort of celebration event in at City Hall in in December to, as the final kind of event of the season. Um, so you know, taken from different workshops, taken from different, um, you know, uh, yeah, examples of, of practice, uh, the walks and stuff, we're going to be having that exhibition there. Um, we've had new collaborations, uh, shared mm. practice. Yeah. Bea, do you want to? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking, yeah, one of the exhibitions actually was actually part of the, part of one of the walks, and that's going to be, that's oh, going to be yeah. part of the thing as well, yeah. Um, Eastside Community Heritage, fantastic, fantastic, yeah, incredible. Uh, organized, fan, incredible. Yeah, a real passion and love for looking at their community in East London. So yeah, new work streams have come out of the work that we've done, which is really great. Um, I'll show you on the next slide, I think, but one of the things that we put together is uh, a heritage directory uh, in, with the practitioners we've worked with, but also other practitioners that we've come across that are doing community related work and we're aware that new work has come out from this for some of the practitioners. Networks have been made, as we say, some people have actually already talking about collaborations they're going to be um, working on next year together. Um, yeah, and so just to say on that, be just that even so some people's, you know, situations change, they weren't able to deliver what they what we hope to deliver in the space of time of the season um so you know on a surface level you think oh they didn't really they didn't really take part but actually in talking to them the feedback has been that just being part of it just being on the website and being held you know in this group has meant a lot um which i think says a lot about the kind of loneliness of, of community practice sometimes um yeah 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 i mean they're all working on separate histories aren't different histories so they're they're going to be probably tied to those sorts of worlds aren't they and especially if they're doing it you know in the evenings when they finish their day jobs as well you know so um so i mean i think you know all in all i think it is definitely a, a sort of a powerful model this idea of bringing together these practitioners which came out of those cdpr roundtables um and you know based on us you know, this is like a realization of those conversations. And there's definitely throughout the season, Damian and I have been thinking and talking about, you know, where, you know, if if this were to happen again, you know, what would we tweak? What would we include? What would what would be important to bring in? Um, 
So that's been, you know, it's been, there's been lots and lots and lots and lots of food for thought. It's been a really amazing, it's been actually a really powerful project to be able to work on, you know, for all of the reasons that we've mentioned. Um, so one of, the, one of the other outcomes is we're working on a documentary, uh, a half hour documentary to kind of highlight as much of the season, as much of what we've spoken about as possible in half an hour. And uh, in terms of resources, um, uh, one resource that we want to share with everybody is the resource pack that has come out of the workshops, which were aimed at guiding people and giving advice on how to set up, organize, curate, take care of and deliver community storytelling projects. So that's going to be something that we kind of circulate uh, as well with the, with the practitioners that we've worked with at the end of this. So this is a screenshot of what the website looked like. I think it's just been changed. So it might look a bit different now. But um, the Heritage Director is what I was speaking about earlier. And um, it was really good to be able to put this together because it meant that we could kind of showcase each guide separately with their own bio and picture and then include other ones. Because that was one of our concerns actually at the beginning. Okay, we've only got this budget we're going to do this much with this with these people what about everybody else you know how do we you know again this idea of inclusivity or kind of bringing everybody in as much as possible and kind of sharing um sharing all these resources in one place so these things are on the website uh, we've already spoken about the relay walk and stuff so and we also included self-guided walks that um yeah. that people yeah. can just do <laughs> yeah themselves I think uh, I think just to just to like literally just last thing because I remember it's because it's a, such a powerful one was the um the events around the Royal Hospital Chelsea which um because I think and again you know this is the same with all of them but this idea I mean that was so overbooked really this idea of being able to offer this opportunity free to people yeah. that would not normally pay you know be able to pay or even think about paying but they really want to know they really want to go inside and see and hear about these histories in front of in you know inside this uh you know incredibly like loaded weighted beautiful building um so i think th that is so important obviously that's not sustainable you can't make it free all the time but i think that this is why the, the sort of you know season has been um so good in terms of like encouraging uh, people to seek out more Mm. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, we've yammered on quite a lot. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's <laughs> one more slide. But we're going to carry on. <laughs> I mean, maybe yeah. Very quickly, maybe, um, if there are any questions, yeah. You know, I mean, really, the, I think what happens next is really about questions. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Oh, thank you so much, Vanessa. That was. Absolutely fascinating. I'm sure there are going to be hundreds of questions. Um, and yeah, actually, I'll just say I, I was a, uh, an attendee at the, the workshop that, that you mentioned with Purple Stars, and I found that so incredibly inspirational, um, not least in the way that prompted me to change the presentation that I was going to give uh as we went through the day because the tips and, and the the uh <laughs> guidance on what works was so powerful and so strong um but yeah it, it showed me up and made me adapt what i did and it was wonderful so i was quite impressed, was quite impressed actually how quickly you responded to that <laughs> <laughs> you adapted that's okay you've got to work on the fly <laughs> it's been... yeah 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 Okay, um, before I, I start with, with, with my own comments, shall we uh, see if anyone wants to, to jump in straight away from the audience? Catherine. <laughs> Is that all right? I feel a bit cheeky kind of sneaking in first. Okay, thank you. What a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm gonna watch the recording back because there's so much to kind of unpack from, from everything you've spoken about. Really inspirational, but I also love the way you were very frank with us about things like risks and challenges and you know some of the, as you said, the kind of tribulations um, involved in a project like this. Um, 
I hope you don't mind me asking this question after the richness of all the different histories that you, you, you've been surfacing through what you've done. I want to ask a question that's a bit more to do with process, actually. But I think it's a really interesting and important issue that you flagged up to do with measuring and metrics. So I realise that does sound really admin -y, doesn't it? Um, but I was so struck by, and I think a lot of us wrestle with these questions in our research and in our engagement activities. And you gave the example of a walk that might have 25 people on it because you can't have more but an event that might be deeply transformative for those people they might carry back into their communities and their neighborhoods in different ways but numbers as a metric don't necessarily capture all the value and the benefits of an activity like that um i've been thinking a lot about metrics recently i don't know if you've come across there's a really brilliant report from the global fund for community foundations called measuring what matters suggesting different principles for metrics, for inspiration and empowerment, which is all really lovely as a principle, but it's a horrible question to ask. I wouldn't like to be asked this. Do you have any sense of what we do need, how we could do measuring differently? Do you see opportunities to kind of co-produce metrics with the communities that you work with? Do you think that there are different approaches that we could take other than you know, the number of people who attended events and those very kind of crude measurements. Do you have any further thoughts? Because I, I, I'd, I'd love to hear your thinking. I mean, I suppose it really depends on what the aims of any particular project are. And I mean, some of our aims were to encourage, well, to encourage Londoners to find out more about their spaces, the, 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 the histories in their public spaces, and you know, hopefully to, to and to want to find out more. And these sorts of things are, are relatively easy to kind of gather as long as people are responding to the survey. <laughs> this is the thing. But I think, and again, I think it depends on the nature of the project as well. For example, on this particular project, we've had some people who have come to almost every single walk, the same faces. In fact, two particular people that have been on literally every single walk. And in, in a case like that, there's an opportunity to have a conversation with them and to get some qualitative feedback from them, which immediately links to some of the aims of, of the season or the project. So I suppose any kind of evaluation really, there's no like, just do this because it depends what your aims are and maybe I suppose thinking about the aims is really where it starts then you know maybe. I think um, just to add to that I think it also um, speaks Catherine a lot to the fact that we need to change the, just change the whole way we are we're recognizing measurement like you're saying it, you know and I know that's such a you know but I do think there have been shifts I do think there are greater understandings from funders or from um yeah from my perspective anyway from funders particularly uh, in you know that expectation around things um so that they are looking a bit more at process they are looking a, li a little bit more you know flexibly around uh what matters because i do think that there's a it's a different thing i you know when you're actually trying to measure a shift in understanding you know like yeah it's really difficult to measure that and it is through conversation it is through um that reflection that that time for reflection and obviously that time costs money because you you know you want do you know what i mean as well like it, it costs everybody mm. um so you know like I'm trying to because for example i recently uh, applied for funding for something and i and i thought i put in you know i put in a chunk for you know this additional work to be done around holding people through this because obviously it's going to be you know it was going to be a difficult thing it's a different process it's still not enough money it's still not enough do you know what <laughs> I mean you know because you, you're held within these very you're still held within these limits though but I do think it's getting incrementally, incrementally better and I do think we all have a responsibility to sort of say no that's not going to give you the information even if we you know what I mean even if it falls on deaf ears for a while we just still have to keep pushing the alternate because it's about fundamental shifts in things isn't it like, yeah you know and again yeah I mean it is really difficult it is really difficult and mm. I think that one of the things we were looking at in this as well was trying to evaluate in different ways and and because we could because we actually mm -hmm. our boss I don't know if she's on uh she's listening she threatened to come and listen um Chetna, <laughs> I see from um into the GLA um 
is really understanding of, of this yeah. and and it, and it took us a while to be like are you worried you know to say sort of are you worried about numbers and it's like no because that's not what this is about yeah um exactly. and they were very you know supportive of this idea of us trying to evaluate differently we wanted to get a poet involved who would reflect on it through poetry um and i think yeah you know it's about pushing pushing it a bit more so, so that people can see the value in that those mm -hmm. kinds of evaluation yeah yeah Oh, thank you so much for your really thoughtful answers. And that there's lots of inspiration there. And also I'm really encouraged by what, uh, an optimistic um, story you're telling about how, how things are becoming more flexible and more open to these kind of imaginative evaluation approaches. Thank you so much. Definitely, thanks so much. I'm um, just reminded that you are absolutely welcome to put questions into the chat if you don't want to speak on the recording. There are two questions at the moment. Uh, Jennifer Hollywood says, will it be run again? I think that's referring to the practitioner workshop. Um, oh, the actual practitioner workshop. I think when we mentioned Purple Stars, I think is when Jennifer put that into the chat. Oh. Well, well. If this, this is, is the question. Yeah, this is the logical this question is... around, around next year and our hopes for, and actually me and Vanessa have a planning meeting tomorrow to try and figure out how we can repeat yeah. this um, in some way, shape or form um, mm. because of all the, yeah, watch this space, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that actually, sorry, sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. I was just going to say that Purple Stars, you know, are absolutely approachable uh, independently. So, do, oh, yeah. you know, and I can't recommend them enough. Absolutely. Yeah, they're them. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really, really powerful yeah. session. So, like I said, definitely. Um, and, but the network that you brought together as part of it made it as well, didn't it? And I think that's that's what's so powerful in the network that you've created through it. Perhaps we'll come back to that in in, a, in another question. Um, there was another question in the chat though. Uh, Claire Dudman asks, um, how far back are you looking um, with this? Are you relating to earlier migrations such as the Huguenots? Yes. Yeah. So um, I think, for example, Jeff Jeff Simmons speaks about these in his some of his walks. Tony Warner speaks about much older history in his walks. So the history is held by these practitioners. They are the experts. They have done the research. They have done the work. They're presenting their their hard you know their hard work. And yeah, so their history goes. Some of their histories definitely goes back as far as that. Yeah. And I'm just it's laughing because. Really on, on one of the walks we went on, uh, I think it was Tony actually, who purposefully uh, mispronounced the Huguenots as the Huguenots. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 the, the Huguenots have definitely been in there for yeah. a few times in this season. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's gonna be an earworm now, isn't it? I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> think of that every time I see. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Richard has a question. Uh, yeah. Um, you just had a question about how historical, how far back the walks go. I wanted to ask a geographical question about whether these walks, whether they work differently in London, maybe from in other places, simply because of the kind of overlap of lots of different histories which are going on within a small area in London. So that, uh, and whether that's advantageous or it creates more problems. I mean, it, it sounds like it's advantageous if you have this sort of relay walk where you have people who are experts on different community histories and they can all do it in the same area. Mm. I mean, on the other hand, London is so big and on a walk, you can probably only walk, especially if it's a very interactive walk, you can't walk very far in an hour or two. Um, so... You know, it works in Trafalgar Square because there's so much stuff going on there that, or that's gone on there. Mm. But does it work in more suburban parts of London? And in fact, just the simple geographical question is, are most of, the, have most of these projects been in inner London and central London? Have they worked out in the, in the suburban boroughs as well? Yeah, I mean, that relay walk started in Trafalgar Square, but it, 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 it was a circuit. It didn't just stay in Trafalgar Square. But yes, I mean, we had walks in Brent. Uh, those, were, those were probably the furthest out walks that we did, like quite far out. Um, also, well, Stratford, but Stratford is the new 
whatever it is, Shoreditch <laughs> yeah. or whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think where else. I mean, Tottenham. but I think generally speaking, I think it, it as a as a thing to do, I think it probably it could work anywhere. Yeah, literally anywhere in the country, I think. It just depends on if somebody is doing the work and excavating and finding out and, you know, finding out the history. Think, yeah, it's about that digging down, isn't it? It mm. really is. Um... Mm -hmm. And obviously, like you, you won't get those overlaps, but you will get surprises, right? Because there are, mm -hmm. you know, it is amazing how the movement of people all over, all yeah. over. Um, yes, I mean, even when we went to the British Ugandan, exactly, you know, one, yeah, 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 they were. I can't remember where the settlement camp was, was now. There was in Wales. There was one of them in Wales, yeah. um, which which the, the documentary looked at. And that was really beautiful, actually, because that was really looking at how the Welsh people uh, volunteered to, to support the um, exiled Ugandan Asians, uh, you know, that support them in settling in and adjusting to uh, life in, in Wales. Um, yeah. That was a really moving one, actually. So I think you know, in terms, I mean, yeah, that's that's kind of quite suburb suburban. <laughs> Very, it was in a, it was yeah. a field, farmland. You know, I think the and actually I think a visit, a walk visual. there. Sorry, V. Sorry to no, an actual walk no, there. Because a walk there would have been amazing. You know, yeah. if, you know, if we could go or go to to Wales and and think about that history in that space. I mean, that's mm. incredible. Those layers, like you know, I don't know. Yeah. 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 But thinking it is about really displacement of people yeah it is an interesting one in in the um the, the differences between the the i suppose it's the the multiplicity or the speed mm -hmm. of the history or something mm. in those areas yeah mm. the density of the history yeah, is, <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you yeah it's uh just, just another thing on that whilst Luke for the next question, just another point, you know, there was one, uh, Hannah Rose Murray, who looks at black abolitionist history, one of the tours that she actually does is also includes places outside London, the different diff other other parts of London are more, uh, sorry, other parts of the UK, I should say, um, including more rural areas where abolitionists travel to, to do, to do what they were doing. So you'd be surprised, you know, there's probably a lot, I mean, you probably, yeah, mm. <laughs> it could work. Yeah, definitely. One thing I wrote down more than once while you were speaking was um, discoverability as kind of one of your challenges of, of discovering people, but, and then making those connections and the challenge for the practitioners. And Damley, you used a phrase that, that really stuck in my memory, the loneliness of community practice. And it strikes me one of your biggest successes during this project has been plugging that gap, has been making those connections and those networks to, to, to combat that. And I guess my question is what the, how, how the legacy of that is, is, is going to be carried forward? How, how do you maintain those connections? between those communities that you've brought together? Yeah, I mean, I think it is really difficult because I think, like we said, uh, in some cases, Vanessa and I have been, were surprised. I mean, you know, we've both been, um, sort of, you know, worked in curating and production before and you kind of understand that, you know, people you're working with often need more than you kind of realise, you know, you become a kind of, uh, you have multiple uses basically, or, or um, but I think that because a lot of this, because a lot of this work is about um, confidence as well, you know, and especially people who have been, who are new to it. Um, so I think, you know, and that's been really special for us to be able to be there to, to give that little bit of extra confidence for people to actually, you know, deliver to large groups of people, larger groups of people than they used to, you know, this might have been the first time that they de delivered a kind of walk. Um, and, you know, it is, hard for us to then think okay well we might not be there again but th that again is why that network is so important mm. um and I think that's obviously why you know um Chetna and Hassan uh, Boulder from the GLA really thought about this to begin with and in discussions with with the community practitioners in these sort of roundtable events that they had by the CDPR is uh, really thinking about how how they can how these groups can support each other better um so I think you know, as we tail out, we're doing a couple more um, 
uh, you know, network based um, events to really cement yeah. that and really enable it to carry on, uh, because I think it's it's really lovely. It's really lovely when you see uh, practitioners yeah. just chatting away to each other, you know, yeah. uh, and making those connections. So I think it's about that. It's it's essentially because that's where they're going to grow from. I mean, we you know, we have limited knowledge, don't we? Be? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly saw some amazing conversations going on over coffee. Uh, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Forming those networks. And yeah, there's so much to be said, isn't there, for, for those coffee conversations. Yeah. Mm. What, yeah. what cements those, those networks. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. There's a few more comments been in the chat. Adam has posted a link to a map of abolitionists' talks all over Britain. Oh. might be worth checking out. Nice. Um, Thank you. Can I mention anything about that? Or... Well, I'm just to, just to say it's one of those things I stumbled upon and keep coming back to because it's it sort of the, 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 a lot of the conversations we have about abolition um, do focus on London. They focus on the big regional centres, whereas in fact you can see there's every possibly every Baptist and Methodist hall anywhere in the safe west anywhere in the in in the east of england in all across wales you know mm. and these are they've it, 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 it trapped through people's diaries and through people's um uh, mm. one of the things i one that i think follow-up projects i think the um, person who's doing it is actually going to look at the buildings and look at the communities that the, these people are addressing so based on the work of frederick douglas but not only frederick douglas so the mapping yeah. is, lovely little mapping project which you know goes to show that of course we think of london of course being a very big very big place because this is just outlying villages around the city so as well mm. so how you how you get a message across is by shoe leather um, and it's there's a nice sort of mirroring there which is what brought it to my mind so partly mm -hmm. mentioning abolitioning and partly the actual process of getting about to deliver these talks and deliver this message yeah that, that Rose Murray, yeah, yeah, yeah. Panna Rose Murray, who's part of that project yes. delivered a couple of walks for us well one online and one in real life um, and she Sorry. does she, her, she's brilliant because she always brings in history about women as well black women yeah. as well which i love <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. yeah thank you and in the chat we also have a a comment of praise from chetna who <laughs> you said is your <laughs> your colleague uh, you've done an excellent job of delivering a superb series with 15 high values so congratulations thank you <laughs> I don't think that sensitivity was another really important point that, that certainly that I took away from from what you were saying and sort of navigating how to handle those issues in a sensitive way. And it seems like you've established some some best practice around that, or some perhaps some guidance that that can feed in for future projects. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that's one of the things. One of the at some stage that was a really really. I think it was probably about a month in or a month and a half in, you know, after having gone on a few walks, we really were talking about that a lot, you know, about that the, the sensitive nature of these histories and how we handle that or how it should be handled rather than how we handle it, how it could be handled, both for the people going on walks and also the, the practitioners doing this kind of work as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah important stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Does anyone else have a question from the audience or shall we go and get our dinners? <laughs> well, that has been a uh, really, really powerful, really, really interesting talk. Um, as I said, it will be available as a recording afterwards. So if anyone wants to, to rewatch, to, to find, um, recaps of some of the names of those groups and names of um, the people leading the tours. I believe many of the um, the people leading the tours kind of do so on a sort of commercial basis or a sort of um, charitable basis, don't they? So yeah. So exactly. yeah, any support that we can direct towards them is yes. very exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. So and uh, thanks from Emily in the chat. But I think at this point, we will perhaps call the formal session to a close. And, and once again, thank you so much um, for the amazing work you've done and for talking to us today.